اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي ربي زدني علما ربي زدني علما ربي زدني علما One of the points that I want to talk about here today that if you look at surah al-falaq in surah al-falaq Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses only one of his properties the rabb and this says come in the protection of the rabb the rabb of the falaq and in the rest of the surah does not brings any of his properties then start talking about things that you should be seeking protection from and come in the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but if you look at surah an-nas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings three of his qualities say qul a'udhu bi rabbin nas means the rabb of the people Malikin nas the ruler of the people ilahin nas the lord of the people that they worship so brings about three of his properties so in one surah only bring one and the other surah brings three so ulama have come to the consensus that the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did this because if you look at surah al-falaq it is only talking about the outside influences And Surah An-Nas talks about the inside influences. And inside influences are far dangerous than the outside ones. So shaitan hurts you deeper inside. The people that we sit with, they influence us deeper inside than the outside. And a lot of the time what happens is that people say they're outside. From the outside they're the best. But from the inside they're the worst. So inside is more dangerous that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pays a lot of emphasis on this particular surah and say you want to come in the protection of the rabb the ruler and then the ilah then we also talked about that this represents the stages of the human creation and the human existence rabb is the quality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that nourishes us when we are here and protects us This represents the nourishment that a baby receives in the early life. And in the early life of the baby, baby only needs nourishment from the outside, from the parents, from the close people. But after a little while when the baby grows up, now needs more than the nourishment. Now need to go out in the society and work in the society and study in the society. So need facilities which are provided by the authorities. So there were the, that's where the word malik comes in. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as an authority is providing facilities to the human being. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes this person come out in the world and get facilitated, the person may still feel a little bit emptiness from inside because he is missing this relationship with his Lord. We find a lot of people who are very successful in life, but they're very empty and shallow from inside. Their hearts are hardened. Their lives are miserable. We see some big superstars in Hollywood and they commit suicide. And some of them are actually comedy actors. They spend their whole life making other people laugh and they commit suicide themselves. The chills they are extremely depressed inside. Yeah. So the connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is extremely important. So when you outgrow, you want that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's why Ilahi Nas is so important that he is the one that you should be worshiping, you must be worshiping. And the reason you need to accept him because what are the other three ayahs, the other half because If you don't do this, then you are giving yourself into the hands of Al-Khannas, the shaitan. And he has this capacity of coming back. He just doesn't make you his disciple and leaves you. No, he corrupts you and corrupts you to an extent where you start corrupting other people. And when a person, according to a hadith, whenever a person does something good and starts something good, As long as that goodness prevails, even if the person dies out, he keeps getting the reward. Similarly, if a person commits something bad and he spreads it, mm-hmm. as long as that bad is spreading, even if the person dies, he keeps getting a part of the sin. So that is why shaitan wants, because that's the promise he made to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that I will take the son of Adam into the hellfire with me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, yes, you will, but except for those people that I will protect. So we want that protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what's extremely important in this surah. And one of the uh, person who was from the tabi'in, means the students of the sahaba, 
He was actually a Persian slave. His name was Malik bin Dinar. He was a slave of Hassan Basri. Hassan Basri, who was a famous person uh, in the history of Islamic history, who actually is the only uh, tabi'i, the students of Sahaba, who, who actually had an opportunity of being nursed by Umm al-Mu'mineen, Umm Salama radiallahu ta'ala. So actually his mom was a slave woman and she used to work in, uh, with Umm Salama's house. So when she was busy working around in the house, so he was a little boy, he was crying. He was like a little baby, he was crying. So Umm Salama fed him, nursed him. So he is the only tabi'i who was actually nursed by the mother of the mu'mineen, the wife of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he was born during the times of Umar radiallahu ta'ala. So this is after the Prophet passed away, that's why he's from tabi'i. So he moved to Basra during the time of Ali radiallahu ta'ala. So he moved to Iraq where everybody, a lot of sahabas were there spreading knowledge, a lot of teachers were there, a lot of institutions were there. So he spent the rest of his life in Iraq in the city of Basra. So that's why he became Hassan al basr But actually till the age of 16, he lived in Medina and he was born in Medina. So he was actually Hassan al Madani who became Hassan al basr So he had this slave Malik bin Dinar. And Malik bin Dinar, even though he was a slave, but he narrated so many hadith from the companions, especially from Anas ibn Malik. And Anas ibn Malik was one of the companions that was a little boy during the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and did not even turn into a teenager or might be close to a teenagehood when the Prophet passed away. So he lived many years after the Prophet and he was uh, among the last three, four sahaba who died. So that is why the later tabi'een Whoever heard hadith, they heard from these people who were kids during the time of the Prophet Muhammad and they lived till the old age. So he narrates hadith from this particular individual who is Anas ibn Malik. So he says, Malik ibn Dinar says, that I am so, I feel so sorry for individuals who live in this world, but they don't taste, they don't taste the beauty of this world. And people are like, what is the beauty of this world? He said, think about it. You are here, away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in this world. And you don't get to love and understand your Lord. That means you never get to taste the beauty of this world. So what is the point of you being here? The point of you being here is, you need to rediscover yourself. And your connection with your Lord. Because your soul came from your Lord. It was connected to your Lord. It came over here and there was a disconnect. So now this connection needs to be reestablished. He is there. He comes there every night. He's around you. He's closer to your juggler way. But you are not making an effort. So you need to make an effort. Because when you make an effort, He makes more efforts exponentially. He says, when you come towards me, walking, I come towards you running. That's your Lord. So he says, I feel sorry for those humans who live here, but they never get to know, your, know their Lord. So this is such a beauty that was included in tafsir, in the books of tafsir, tafsir, that the connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is extremely important. Extremely important. So last time we talked about uh, uh, the point that shaitan tries to get into our hearts and tries to convince us to do bad things. Now you would have also noticed that majority of the prophets would have received their prophecy around the age of 40. Except for two people that we know of. One, Yahya alayhi salam, and the other one, Isa alayhi salam. These are the two people that Quran says that right from the beginning, they had declared or the showed sign of being a prophet. Other than that, majority of them declared to the humans that we are prophets at an age of 40. These are the only two people who declared it at an early age. So, why the age of 40? Because on the average in humanity, age of 40 is considered to be an age where you actually start getting a little bit more mature and stable. Maturity may come a little bit early, like in 20s for some people, earlier, some 30s, but stability in your thought process comes at the age of 40. 
That is why the people who are in their later age, like 50s, 60s, it is hard to convince them on the things that they have not been doing all their life. Because to them, they fight it, even though they realize that it is the right thing, they still fight it back. Why? Because they're like, if I accept it now, that means all my life I have not been doing it, so I don't want to feel with the guilt. I don't want to live with the guilt. So, that, so this is a psychological process. They start, they start this argument as a way of competition. There are some people who realize that, oh, I was wrong, and they repent, and they come on the right path. But at the same time, you're going to find people that if you try to tell them, come pray, it's, oh, oh, we know. We know. We know we have to pray. You don't need to tell us. Why? Why this attitude comes in? Because they are at the point where things have so mature that these statements don't affect them anymore. Somebody has to go deeper. Somebody has to go through a different route to get them and bring them back. So the problem comes in when we try to go with adults the same way you go with a five-year-old, a six-year-old, it takes some of the adults off. And they basically get aggravated because the ego kicks in, because the shaitan kicks in, because the hardness of the heart kicks in. So 40 years is extremely important. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, that is why, that when a human being, when he grows and reaches the age of 40 years. Arba'in means 40. Arba'in means 4. Arba'in means 40 in Arabic. Then what does he say? Qala. He says, Rabbi awzi'ni an ashkura ni'mataka allati an'amta alayhi. Then he starts realizing. And then he comes to his Lord and says, Oh Allah, make me among those people who are thankful to you for all the blessings that you have given me. Wa ala walidayya and on my parents. Wa a'mala salihan and I want to be doing good things. وَتَرْضَاهُ That you are happy with me. وَأَصْلَحْ لِي فِي ذُرِّيَّتِي And among my children. Because now he's in a different stage of life. He's not himself alone. He has kids who are not little anymore. His kids are growing up. And now he's realizing, Oh my God, what have I been doing? What kind of a person I was to my parents? Oh my God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, be merciful to them. They tried their level best to fix me. And now these kids are teaching me what kind of individual I was. So Allah fix them, fix me. I am sorry for what I have done all my life. I am extremely. I want to accept the faith. And I want to enter the faith. And I want to be the people among the people who are true to your faith. So there's a time when the reality hits, when things stabilize. So people either go this way or that way. There is a change in life. So that is why that age is extremely important. And the years before that, you're still building your personality. Now there are people who are good from the beginning. So goodness attracts them. There are people who are not that good from the beginning. So goodness does not attract them that easily. So that's why it's extremely important to have a good company. Sit among good people. So the thought process is good. Thought process plays a lot of vital roles here. And then if you notice that when you have a feeling or an urge of happiness or sadness or an urge to commit a sin or an urge to commit a goodness, your heart has this tick of a moment. You know, there's a little heartbeat change. If it's a sin or if it's a goodness, you feel that. But there's a difference in the feeling of urging towards a sin and urging towards khayr. There's a difference in feeling. If you urge towards the khayr, there is a peace that is followed by that movement, the wave movement. And if it is towards the shah, the evil, then after that urge, it just urges you to do it, man. Come on, do it. And after that, your heart hardens. You don't feel peace inside. So it's a movement, but it does not have the same effect. Why? Because you're getting influenced by different forces. So that is why it's extremely important to maintain that, to maintain that company of the good people. Okay, one of the things that um, I really found very interesting here, that a lot of the time when we come at sin, or when we think that we have become good, and we have been urged to do bad, one of the reactions, this is a psychological reaction, we get mad. When we are urged to do sin, we get mad. 
And this madness and this anger is on shaitan. Like, why is he compelling me to do it? I'm fighting him. Why is it so hard to control myself? And this is an urge. This is a feeling. This is another plot that he plays against us. Then what happens? And he plays with our psychology and says, Why are you taking the stress? Release it. And then you're talking to yourself. How should I release it? Come with this in, man. It's okay. Take yourself out of this misery. When you're out of this misery, go back to the right path. And that, if you listen to him, he will put you away from the right path and that will harden your heart. It's going to become difficult for you to come back. He plays with us. That's the problem. He plays with us. He played with Adam. And I've told you this before. He promised Adam. He said, promised by God, Adam. وَقَاسَمَهُمَا إِنِّي لَكُمَا مِنَ النَّاصِحِينَ I am your well-wisher. إِنِّي I am. Indeed. In Arabic language, the word إِنِّي means indeed. Because on noon there is a double emphasis. That is why when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called Musa on the tour, on the mountain, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't say, An Allah, said, Innani an Allah, indeed I am the Lord. So the word indeed is of emphasis. So he says, Inni lakuma min al Yes, indeed I am. I am the one who is your well wisher. And then he said to Adam, Adam, okay, if you're not getting convinced, I'm going to give you a way so that you are going to be convinced. Then why am I your well-wisher? He said, okay, tell me, why are, why are you my well-wisher? He said, think about it. Would you not love to stay in Jannah forever? He said, of course. He said, but remember, your God has created you as the Khalifatul Ard, somebody who has to take care of the planet Earth. So eventually you have to exit the heavens. There is only one way you can stay here. And that is if you eat from this tree. That's why he has forbidden you from eating from the tree because he doesn't want you to stay here. He wants you to leave. And in the love of the Lord, he deceived us. So that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all over the Quran does not say that Adam committed a sin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنَسِيَتْ Adam forgot. Adam forgot. He did not say Adam committed a sin. But Adam felt it. That, oh my God, what have I done? So of course he repented. He repented. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was so merciful, himself taught Adam how to repent. And that's what Surah Al-Baqarah tells us. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I told Adam how to repent. I taught him. So this is his idea, that's his plot. He tries to play with us. So, what should we do when we run into these situations? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to calm down, slow down, and be peaceful. Instead of getting angry and then falling in his trap. Because remember, all over the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us to be patient have supper, to relax, rather than get angry and mad. Because remember, when a man came to the Prophet and asked, is there any advice for me? Three times Prophet said, La taqba, do not be angry. Because he knew the nature of this person who was short-tempered. It's because when you are angry, you do things that you would not do otherwise. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be from the patient people. So, if you run across people who make you angry. Now, you're not angry from inside, but people are trying to make you angry. They try to provoke you. And there are a lot of people from among us and from outside. So, Quran says, Then stay away from ignorant people. Don't indulge in conversations with them. Why? Because it's pointless. They are not there to understand. They're there to play with you. So don't fall in that trap. That's why in Surah Al-Kahf, when the people of the Kahf was revealed and the story was revealed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to his Prophet, do not get into any kind of argument with the people of the book about the number of the count of the people of the cave. Because they themselves are disputed in this matter. 
Some say there were three, some say there were five, some say there were seven. So, number is not important. The message is important. So that is why things that have no outcome, don't get involved in it. And you will notice a lot of the time when we're sitting together, we get into heated debates and arguments on things that don't really matter to nobody. It's just a matter of wasting time. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَعْرَدْ عَنِ الْجَاهِلِينَ Leave these people alone and stay away from them. That is why, وَإِمَّا يَنْزَغَنَّكَ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ نَزْغُنْ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ Whenever shaitan tries to play a plot around you, come in the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now notice these last three words of the ayah. Innahu, another double emphasis. Innahu, because of the shadda. Indeed, he is the one who is, what? Sami'ah. He listens. He knows it all, whatever is happening. And he is alim. He knows. He doesn't, he doesn't just listen. He knows as well. He knows exactly what you are going through. وَقُلْ رَبِّ أَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنْ هَمَدَاتِ الشَّيْطَانِ And say this as a dua. Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I want to come in your protection from the plots of the shaytan. وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ رَبِّ أَنْ يَحْضُرُونَ And I want to come in your protection from the time when they come to me and convince me to be like them. And this is not talking about jinn in particular. It is talking about shaitan. And Surah An-Nas says that could be min al-jinnati wal-nas. That could be from the jinn and from the insan, from the humans. Because the word shaitan, yes, in commonly speaking, people are talking about iblis. But shaitan is actually a set of characteristics. That's what it is. Shaitan basically is a set of characteristics. What exactly what the word shaitan means? We talked about it in Surah Al-Fatiha. It basically means somebody that has been thrown away from the mercy of the Lord. He's away from the mercy of the Lord. So now somebody who's away from the mercy of the Lord could be from the jinns and could be from the humans. So either way, we want to be away from these people and we do not want them us to be falling in their plots. So that's another thing I wanted to talk about. Then, Quran also talks about one beautiful thing, to empower us. Because a lot of the time, people, despite the fact we are humans, and shaitan in the form of jinn, is far inferior to us. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked an entire set of malaika, the angels, to bow down to Adam. Because Adam was a better creation. Not in terms of power, not in terms of might, because angels are, ooh, huge, might, powerful, that a handful of them destroyed the entire villages of Lut alayhi salam. Just three, four of them were enough to destroy everybody. The bunch of people who came during the time of other prophets just destroyed the entire nations with no problem. So in might and power, they're far more superior. But where do we become powerful? In terms of knowledge. And that's exactly what Allah laid the foundation. That when angels said, how is it possible that humans were going to run the business over here? We don't find any qualities in them to be running the business. They're a bunch of people who will fight and kill. Now that raises a question, who fights and kills? Animals. Why? Because they don't have knowledge. The knowledge to an extent of improving themselves. Looking around things and making a betterment. A giraffe all its life eats the same leaves. Never thinks about, I should break a wood and make a house from that myself, from these. It doesn't think like that. It stays the same way for millions of years. It is the human that thinks about things and learn. That is why Adam was taught. So Allah says, وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا Everything Adam needed to know, I taught him. And asked the angels, now let's compete on this grounds. And they could not compete, so they surrendered. So that sajda that they performed was in surrender, means we accept him and we will help him. Shaitan refused to help him. Iblis refused to help Adam. Because he did not think Adam was superior to him. Because he was still looking at how things were created. 
he was not looking at the knowledge set. He said, oh, how, why should I worship? Why should I bow down to him? Khalaqtani min nari wa khalaqtahu min teen. I am created from fire and he is created from clay, which stinks. I don't want to be bowing down to a stinky source. He's looking at the source. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Inna kayd al-shaytani kana da'ifa. The plot of the shaytan is weak. Da'if means weak. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it very clear to us that mu'mineen do not worry about it. His plot is weak. When you are weak, you fall in it. But when you're strong, you fight him. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says when you start reading the Qur'an, فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنِ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ Come in the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the shaitan rajim. Why? Because a lot of the time people read Qur'an and they go away from the Qur'an because shaitan plays with their heads. And there are people who come to the Qur'an and they get the guidance. And they were not guided before. So you have to come in the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues says, إِنَّهُ لَيْسَ لَهُ سُلْطَانِ He has no power. He's not a sultan. He's not a king. He's not an emperor. He has no power. إِنَّ لَهُ إِنَّهُ لَيْسَ لَهُ سُلْطَانٌ عَلَى الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Those who people who believed. And وَعَلَى رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ those who believe in their Lord to an extent the Lord is my only helper. Their tawakkul is in their Lord. So first you've got to believe and then you've got to believe that He is my protector. Those kind of people, He will not going to have any effect. Who will He will going to have effect on? إِنَّمَا سُلْطَانُهُ عَلَى الَّذِينَ يَتَوَلَّوْنَهُ He will be the king of the people who left Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ بِهِ مُشْرِكُونَ And those people who associate others with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the kind of people who are going to fall in his hand as victims. So those were some of the things I wanted to bring forth before I bring you some of the stories of these jinns which are nice and the jinns which are bad. As we come to know in the books of Hadith. So there is a hadith reported by Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Ahmadullah alayhi. He said that once shaitan tried to attack the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, and they came in flocks. It was in the earlier time of his prophethood in Makkah. They tried to attack him so that they tried to convince him and have influence. So they tried coming down from the mountains in flocks. And that was the time when Jibra'il showed up and said to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, why don't you say this dua? I want, O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I want to come in your protection, in your complete protection. Min sharri ma khalaq. Everything that you have created that is born and it increases. Anything that comes from the sky. Anything that comes from the earth and it grows and in anything uh, that comes at the at the night. One nahar. So he basically said this dua, and what happened the moment he said this dua, all the shaitan vanished. They all went away. So they tried their level best to attack him. Now, when Khalid ibn Walid, this is reported by Imam Bihaqi, he says, when Khalid ibn Walid asked Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that shaitan and the other jinns are bothering me, are bothering me. So, when I try to do righteous deeds, they try to pull me away. They try to instill bad thoughts in my mind. What should I do? And Prophet taught him the same dua. And he said this dua to stay away from the protection of shaitan. Then, this is reported by Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim, this particular hadith, that once Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam was praying at the night time, and Abi Huraira radiallahu ta'ala reports, and shaitan tried to attack 
means when they attack, they don't attack physically like you and I know as humans do. Their attacks are very different. Their attacks are deceiving. They try to take your focus away from what you're doing. So the Prophet is praying. And he tries to bring his focus away from the prayer to an extent that he would break it. So the Prophet ﷺ grabbed it. And the Prophet said that I wanted to tie him to one of the pillars in the Masjid al Nabi. I wanted to tie him. So that when the morning comes, people would see him and the children of Medina will go to mess with this shaitan. But when I was about to do that, I remember this ayah from Surah Islam that my brother Sulaiman salam said this dua, Rabbi habli mulkan la yambagi li ahadim min ba'di. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make me a king of a kingdom that nobody after me shall have. So if I would have exposed the jinn, then that was something Sulaiman did and nobody ever did before him or after him. So that thought that Sulaiman asked for the dua, I did not expose him. I did not want that particular privilege to be away from the Sulaiman. So that's why I did not expose him. Otherwise, I felt like I would expose him so that people will get to know that who is he and how he comes and deceives people. Similar hadiths have been reported in Muslim Ahmad and Muslim and other books of hadiths. Then, another hadith which is also reported by Imam Bukhari, another very interesting one. Abu Huraira said that in the Madani time when our days were better and we started collecting all this money from, to be distributed to poor, so when all this money and all this wealth and all these food items were collected, so I was made responsible to take care of these things. So one night a man came and he tried to steal things. I grabbed him, I caught him. And he started crying, I'm like, please let me go, I have little kids, I'm a poor man. Please let me have some of it, anyway you are going to give it to us, we are poor people of Medina. So I let him go, he went away. Next day when I went for the Fajr, I did not tell the Prophet. He asked me, Oh Abu Huraira, uh, tell me about the guy that you caught last night. <laughs> and I said, Oh Prophet, he was a poor man, I let him go. And the Prophet said, he's a liar, he will come back again tonight. So Abu Huraira said, I'm guarding, and the guy comes again. And I grab him. And he again makes the same excuse. I said, no, I'll take you to the Prophet. He said, no, 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 please don't take me. I'm a poor man. I do not want to be unprivileged from this privilege that you will distribute to us. I feel pity. I let him go. Next day, Prophet asks the same thing and I say the same thing. He says, he's a liar. We'll come back again. He comes the third night. I grab him. I said, no, Allah, I'm going to let you go this time. He said, I'll tell you something that is better for you and then you will let me go. He said, okay, what is it? He said, you really want to be protected from me? He said, yes. He said, just say Ayatul Kursi at the night time and Allah will appoint an angel for you to protect you from me. And he said, that statement made me so happy that I let him go. Next day the Prophet asked, what happened to the guy that you caught last night? He said, you know what the Prophet, he told me this. And the Prophet said, indeed, Indeed, even though he's a liar, what he told you is the truth. <laughs> what he told you is the truth. So this is how he used to come and he too used to deceive the companions. And also another story that came from another companion, Ubay ibn Ka'b, and he said, I was made to guard, I was made to guard my dates. I was made to guard my dates. And Shaitan came and start eating from it. And then I realized that why are my days decreasing? So I started guarding myself. And I caught him. And I caught him again. And I caught him the third time. Same excuse. He's giving to Ubay ibn Ka'ab. The third time he catches him, he said, okay, I'm going to tell you what to do so that you are protected from me. He said, what should I do? He said, read the last two ayahs of Surah Al-Baqarah at the night time and you will be protected from me. So 
he reveals information sometimes to get himself away. But when he can get away, he doesn't reveal the truth. So that means he knows. He is an alim. He is an alim. That's why he knows things. He just is an alim who does not want to be righteous. That's basically what is quality that we should be careful about. And there are so many other incidents reported in so many different books of hadith. Then another story that is reported by Imam Bahaqi that when the Khaybar was conquered, where the where a lot of the Jewish settlements were, when it was conquered, and one of the companions was returning, two men started following him. A third man started following those two men, and he called them to come back. He constantly called them to come back, and finally they returned. So the man who was calling them, he came to the companion and said, you know what, all three of us, we are jinns, we're not humans. We have been appointed by our community to go and collect the zakah. So it is our duty to go and collect the zakah. These guys in the middle of collecting the zakah, they saw you. So they started following you because you're going to Medina and that would, that's how they will go to the Medina and meet the Prophet. But we can't leave our responsibility and come with you. So the only thing we would like you to do is when you reach Medina, say our salam to the Prophet. So there were good jinns too. There were good jinns too. So when he came to the Medina, so he told the Prophet the whole story. The Prophet didn't say anything about that. That you know. So these are the kind of things. Then another another story, which is reported by an, uh, Imam uh, Bahaqi, and this is reported by the son of Umar ibn Umar Abdullah ibn Umar. He says we were sitting in the Masjid al Nabwi when a man who was scary, ugly, smelly, never seen before, entered the masjid and sat where we were sitting with the Prophet. And he came and right away started quest asking questions like, who created you? Like, who created you? And the Prophet said, Allah created me. He said, okay, who created the skies? And the Prophet said, Allah created the skies. He said, okay, who created the earth? The Prophet said, Allah created the earth. He said that who created Allah? See, this is the thing that what I was talking about earlier on. He messes with you. So he said, who created Allah? And the Prophet put his head down. And when he lifted his head up, the guy already stood and went away. And the Prophet asked the companions, go and catch this guy. And the companions ran after. But the guy vanished in thin air. He exited the door of the Masjid and he was gone. No news. So the companion came back and said, we could not find him. He said, that was the Iblis himself. When he tried his disciples and they could not mess up with you, he personally came to mess up with you, to mess your brains, so that you become confused and, okay, how was God created? So that is why when somebody instills that question, that means it is certainly coming from the shaitan and his forces to, to mess with our thinking process and our belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jinns have similar things as the humans do. That is why the bad among the jinns would like to get company with the bad among the humans because they find attraction in them. And good among the jinns would like to get in the company of good among the humans because they find attraction in them. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين فاستغفره إنه هو الغفور الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إننا كنا من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إننا كنا من الظالمين ربنا زدنا علما ربنا زدنا علما ربنا زدنا علما اللهم صل على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم